Hello, welcome back to Retirement Clarity Radio. My name is Scott Newhouse. I am your host. I'm so glad that you are joining me, especially as we talk about such an important topic, long-term care, and specifically, eight ways to pay for your long-term care needs. Now, before we get into today's episode, if you want a more comprehensive view of everything that you need to do as you plan and strategize uh, for your retirement, and you call it quits from the day job, the nine to five, go to freeretirementbooks.com, and from there, you're you'll be able to actually download for free three retirement books that I've written, one on taxes, one on Social Security and Medicare, and one on like 65 questions that you and your spouse need to be asking yourselves as you plan to retire. Also, a little warning, um, actually a little forwarding actually, I am going to be writing some more books on retirement planning issues. Hopefully I can get them done in 2021, Um, but if not, you just definitely want to bookmark that page, download all the books, um, or if you want, you can buy them on Amazon and give uh, Mr. Mr. Bezos a couple more uh, dollars. I don't think he needs it, but if you want to, you can. Okay, so let's get into today's episode, Eight Ways to Pay for Long-Term Care Needs. Now, emphasis on needs. I'm saying there, we need... I'm saying I'm going to list out eight ways to pay for your long-term care needs. Not necessarily, hey, you need to be, buy long-term care insurance. So there's a difference there. We need to make a plan for your long-term care needs. We don't necessarily need to buy insurance. I know some financial advisors, some insurance salesmen, um, they're adamant that you need long-term care insurance. Frankly, from my perspective, it's not necessary for every single person. Now, I don't think it's a bad option, um, and I think it's appropriate for a lot of people. I'm just saying you don't necessarily need it, but you need a plan for your long-term care needs, and that's what we're talking about today. I'm going to highlight some facts that I've mentioned before, but it's just really important. Um, Anywhere from 66 to 70% of people who reach the age of 65 are going to need long-term care for at least some period of time. Here's my big problem with this. We don't know if that's going to be just a couple months or many years. Um, I've, I've shared before, um, you know, my grandmother needed long-term care help for six years. Now, that's above the average. Um, the average is around maybe a year to a year and a half. And uh, a number of people, honestly, only need long-term care help for a few months, uh, three months or less. So I don't know where you're going to fall into that. And that's the problem that we have here. And that's what we're trying uh, to figure out. So since we can't predict the future, what Uh, long-term care insurance does is it protects you against the potentially high cost of long-term care. Now, if you're only going to need it for a couple months, yeah, you can probably pay that out of pocket, even though it would be annoying and it would be expensive. But if you're going to need it for six years, like my grandmother, wow, that's that's hundreds of thousands of dollars um, out of your pocket if you don't have long-term care insurance. Um, And so that's just something you'd have to think about, you know, would you be comfortable paying all of that out of pocket? Um, Okay, so as I said before, we're going to cover eight different ways to pay for your long-term care needs. Some of you are not going to like some of these options, so be warned, and if you don't like it, that's fine. Just cross it off the list. All I'm trying to do is give a comprehensive view of of eight ways I think we can uh, pay for your long-term care needs. I'm going to start with four traditional ways that you're probably familiar with, and then later on I'm going to discuss four alternative options. So the first option is one that I've mentioned before. It's just paying for it out of pocket. If you've got enough resources, if you've got enough assets, you might be able to pay for all of your long-term care uh, needs with money you've saved and invested. Uh, So you can just consider things like your stable income, like your social security income, any pensions you get, any money you get from rental real estate. You might say, hey, that already pays a whole lot of of what I need on a daily basis. And then maybe if I need long-term care, I can just deplete some of my investment assets or my bank account. or you know, if you have an additional home, uh, you know, maybe you can take some equity out of there in some way. Maybe you sell it and, and turn that into a, um, a way to pay for your long-term care needs. I'm, I'm just saying, if you have enough assets, you might be able to pay for this out of pocket, um, assuming it doesn't um, harm you too much when you deplete those assets, especially in terms of your daily income. The second way you can pay for your long-term care needs, and this is extremely limited, and so this isn't a long-term care option, but it's more like short-term care needs, is Medicare. Um, So Medicare really does not offer much in the way of long-term care needs, but Medicare does cover short-term nursing home stays after an accident or conditions that necessitates hospitalization. So Medicare can cover um, up to 100 days of skilled nursing treatment per disease or illness per benefit period. And But after 100 days, and this is the key part, after 100 days, 
uh, you're going to be required to pay 100% of the cost out of pocket. So again, it's extremely limited. Um, and then once you're out of the facility, um, your benefit period ends and you get a new benefit period after you have not gotten any inpatient hospital care or skilled nursing treatment for 60 days in a row. So let me... Um, and then so then once that's been met, then you're eligible for a new benefit period and that new 100 days where Medicare can split the cost uh, with you uh, up to those 100 days. So let's say you get um, ill in January and you get better in, I don't know, let's say March. If you go a full 60 days in a row, let's say your next illness begins in July, then, then you're eligible for that new 100 day period where a Medicare will split the cost with you. But if you're going to need long-term care help for an extended period of time over that 100 days, Medicare is not an option. Um, and it really just doesn't offer much. That's one thing people don't know. Medicare does not offer much in the way of long-term care help. Uh, the third option, and a lot of people aren't going to like this, but it's an option for some people, is Medicaid. Now, Medicaid is a government-run program by the federal government as well as your uh, your specific state. So if you run out of assets and you still need long-term care help, then that's where you would go uh, to get the, uh, the help that you need. You would go to Medicaid. Um, now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, relying on a government program to take good care of you when you need help the most, and you especially need help the most when it comes to your long-term care, it's it's not a plan that I love. Um, there, there likely will be service delays in getting the care that you need, and you know, frankly, the quality of service isn't going to be as good as a privately run facility in, in most circumstances. In addition to that, the options that you have through Medicaid are going to be limited uh, compared to the private options. And then there's the whole uh, issue of assets. And so again, Medicaid is you know really for low income folks who have low income as well as low net worth. Um, so if you've got a million, you know, a couple million in the bank, um, you know, this really isn't going to be an option for you. So. For Medicaid, you have to have really low uh, countable funds. It's typically $2,000 um, in countable funds, like in the bank account or in some kind of investment account. And then you also have to have a, a monthly income limit. And that depends on your state, but it's not really high. I don't want to get into the specifics because it does, it does depend on your state. But if you have a lot of assets, this is not a good option for you. But if you can see... Uh, maybe you haven't saved up as much as you would have liked and you don't have much in the way of assets, then this absolutely could be an option for you, but it's really complex. I would absolutely recommend speaking with a certified financial planner or someone qualified in Medicaid planning. That's what it's called, Medicaid planning, um, to see if this is an option to cover your long-term care needs. Okay, and then my fourth way of the traditional ways to cover it is, of course, long-term care insurance. And so long-term care insurance, you can either pay monthly premiums to purchase a plan or you can pay some kind of lump sum up front uh, to help you cover a plan. And I've talked about these in detail, so I won't go into too much detail on this uh, portion, um, but the rates are going to vary depending on when you buy the policy, the, pol uh, the payout length, how many years are you going to be covered, the quality of benefits, as well as the comprehensiveness of benefits. Um, and those are all the different factors that are going to determine how much you're going to pay. Now, the average premium, according to the American Association for Long-Term Care Insurance, the average premium for a healthy couple that bought a policy in 2020 uh, at the age of 55 would be uh, per year for both of them $3,050. Now, that's that's really low. If you wait five years up till age 60, your premium is going to go up. Obviously, the, the longer you wait, the more your premium is going to go up, you know, just because you're older. Um, but then the, the downside of that is if you buy it in 55, at, at, in you know when you turn 55 if you buy it then i mean the odds that you need it in your 50s and even in your 60s they're low it happens but it's just it's just a low probability so you might be paying those premiums for a longer time and you know the dilemma that we have is we don't know when you're going to need long-term care and we don't know how long you're going to need it and we don't know the comprehensiveness that you're going to need care um, it might be really small stuff that you can do in your home and just hire someone per hour or it might be more comprehensive where you need a nursing home to take care of you 24 7. so there's just so many variables in here this is really tough um, these traditional policies typically work typically work where you pay for it every month and if you don't use it then the premium payment's gone so it's kind of like uh, the car insurance that we have if we pay for car insurance every month and we don't get into an accident and we don't you know make any claims then that money's just gone it's the same way with these traditional long-term care policies so as long as you're physically okay um, 
you, and you don't need it, uh, you're not going to get that money back. You're not going to get any benefit from it. So you could be paying these premiums for, for years or decades before you need them. And frankly, you may never need them, although some people do at some point. Okay, so there's a lot of pros and cons to the four traditional options that I just mentioned before, especially the, the traditional long-term care insurance. Um, because of the downsides um, with those traditional insurance policies, uh, ha how they're you know, pay as you go and you don't get those premiums back. Um, there has been some changes in terms of different options for getting long-term care, but not having to get a traditional long-term care insurance policy. And so we'll get into those in a second. Also, um, those policies can be hard to qualify for because there's a lot of medical underwriting with them. And so these next four tri uh, non-traditional options for getting long-term care needs met are going to have less medical underwriting um, obstacles for you and, and your spouse to jump over. So that's kind of how I'm framing it. And these next four aren't as common as the four options that I just mentioned before. So again, we're going over eight. We've just done three gone through four and we've got four more alternative options and again if you don't like an option just cross it off your list and go to the next one okay so the first non-traditional option this is our fifth one overall is actually something called short-term care insurance it's also known as convalescent insurance and so basically it's a policy that provides medical benefits for one year or less and so it's that's why it's hence the name short term it's not long-term care it's one year or less um coverage and these policies typically cover home care assisted living and nursing home care when you can't take care of yourself so those are all the main things that long-term care insurance covers but the big difference of course is that it's only going to be for one year or less the rates are typically lower than conventional uh, long-term care coverage plans because the insurance providers are not required to make that long-term pledge so they're not on the hook for you know you needing a nursing home uh, for three or five or six years which would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars they're only on the hook for that one year or less um, for a 65 year old the average again you got to look up uh, specifics in your state in your health circumstances but the average rate for short-term care is $105 per month and the daily benefit can range from $100 per day uh, which equals around 3,000 a month on a 30 day uh, uh, excuse me on a um, on a month that has 30 days up to $200 per day or $6,000 per month. Um, so many candidates who are actually turned down by standard traditional long-term care policies might be approved by short-term care insurance because the costs are much cheaper and the coverage is only, again, for that one year or less. Um, also, these policies have little, little to no elimination period, which means that people who sign up for them can get coverage right away. So that is a nice perk. So that's our first non-traditional option, short-term care insurance. The second option we have is a really unique one, um, and I have not heard too much about this um, you know, in the long-term care space, but it's called critical care or critical illness insurance. So people who get diagnosed with cancer or stro a stroke, a heart attack, or some kind of significant disease um, may have purchased critical care or critical illness insurance, and that actually provides a lump some cash compensation when one of those critical illnesses arises in your life. So for instance, let's say I have critical care insurance um, and I have a stroke and, and strokes, you know, in that policy that I purchased. Once, once it's, you know, approved by the insurance policy, once they just check out that I actually had the stroke, then my policy could pay out a lump sum and a lump sum of let's say a hundred thousand dollars and then my policy's terminated so there's nothing ongoing after all of that and all the expenses that I incur after I have that stroke will be up to my health insurance coverage as well as me paying for it out of pocket assuming again I don't have long-term care insurance but on the bright side I'll have a hundred thousand dollars that's gonna help me pay uh, for those costs so you know if you're worried that you might have um, one of the you know cancer stroke heart attack something significant like that you don't qualify for long-term care or you can't you know afford it then you could consider a critical care insurance so that if something like that happens you get a chunk of change to help you pay um, for all of those medical expenses and what's going to happen after that now this is not a replacement for long-term care because it simply won't cover as much in terms of illnesses that long-term care will um, and again you need to look through the specific policy see exactly what's covered and what's not um, and if it makes sense for you but again not an addition um, or excuse me not a replacement for long-term care um, because it really just doesn't cover as much and then that is my second alternative to
to uh, the traditional uh, options. My third one is an annuity with a long-term care rider. Now, look, I've got to say right at the outset, annuities are complex and I'm not necessarily recommending them. I frankly don't love them personally and I don't um, really recommend them. Uh, but we, So we're not going to get into all the details today. I've actually written a book, um, 65 Questions to Ask and Answer Before You Retire, and there's a whole section that goes into annuities and why I don't love them, um, as well as why some people might buy them and, and alternatives to using annuities in your retirement. But that's neither here nor there. You can get um, an annuity with something called a long-term care rider so that you buy the annuity, you add this rider with long-term care, and then you can get long-term care coverage through that annuity without any, having to get long-term care uh, insurance, that standalone long-term care insurance policy. There's going to be, again, there's going to be less medical underwriting. So if you don't qualify for the traditional long-term care policy, you may be able to qualify through the annuity with the long-term care rider. Now, as I've said before, annuities are complex, so um, I want to keep this really simple, but basically with an annuity, you enter into a contract with an insurance company and you can either pay them an upfront lump sum uh, you know, payment or you can make a series of payment and then they agree you agree to pay you some kind of amount now or in the future. It's either an immediate annuity or deferred annuity, but they pay something in the future based on the policy details. I'm not going to get into the math because it's way too confusing. I'm just trying to make the point that you can buy an annuity and add on a long-term care rider, get less, um, or excuse me, have to go through less medical underwriting and still get some kind of long-term care coverage uh, through that annuity. And then depending on how the annuity is structured, there is the chance that, you know, when the annuity owner passes away, there the proceeds inside the annuity, uh, if there's any left, they can be uh, distributed to your beneficiaries minus any withdrawals that you had from income or long-term care treatment. So that's all I want to say on that. Let's get into my last option um, of the non-traditional options and that's a life insurance policy with a long-term care rider. So these policies are actually going to work really similar to the way that the annuity with the long-term care rider works. So let's say you decide to purchase a life insurance that has the option of a long-term care rider. You can either make a, a large single premium payment or you can make installment payments over a period of years. From there the poli policy you choose is going to pay out a certain amount of death benefits when you pass away and it'll also have the ability to pay for your long term care needs up to policy limits. Now, the policy's death benefit on this life insurance policy will be reduced if you use your policy for long-term care needs, depending on how much you use. Um, so to make this a little bit easier, I, I got an example from a, pol uh, excuse me, from a type of insurance from Lincoln Financial's Money Guard 2 policy. And it should go without saying this is not an endorsement in any way, it's just an example. So here's the example they came up with. A 60-year-old female non-smoker pays a single $100,000 premium for up to 457, uh, excuse me, $453,000 in long-term care benefits or almost 4.5 times the premium. So long-term care benefits could pay out for up to six years at up to $6,303 per month. Now, if she never used the policy for long-term care, it would pay a death benefit of $151,000 and change to her beneficiary. And after year five, she could get her $100,000 back that she put in as a premium. She could get that back if she didn't want the policy any longer and she hadn't used any of the long-term care benefits. So obviously it's complex. That's going to depend. All those numbers um, are going to depend on your specific circumstance and what's going on with your health and your family history, um, etc. But that's kind of the structure of how these long-term care, uh, excuse me, how these life insurance policies with a long-term care rider can work for you. If you don't want to go through that traditional policy, you can still get something back with the long uh, life insurance policy with the long-term care rider if you don't end up needing it. And that's unlike the traditional pay-as-you-go uh, long-term care insurance policy. That's kind of a standalone policy that operates much in the way uh, that our car insurance does. If you use it and if you pay for the premiums and you don't use it, then you're simply out that money. So these are some alternatives. I know I've covered a lot today. Uh, I've covered four main traditional, most talked about ways to cover your long-term 
excuse me, to cover your long-term care leads needs. And then I talked about four alternative options as well. So to recap, the traditional ways are a long-term care insurance policy, kind of pay as you go. You can use Medicaid once your assets are drawn down significantly. You can use Medicare for a very, very temporary period of time, or you can pay it out of uh, pocket. And then the alternatives that I've presented are buying uh, short-term care insurance, uh, critical care insurance, buying an annuity with the long-term care rider, or buying a life insurance policy with the long-term care rider. So as we leave today, I want to encourage you to do two things. First, I've mentioned this on a previous podcast, but if you go ahead and go go to your internet browser and then search for Genworth, G-E-N-W-O-R-T-H, T-H, long-term care cost, uh, you're going to see a great website by Genworth that's going to detail the cost of long-term care by your specific state and location. It's the best tool that I have seen uh, that shows the averages of what long-term care actually costs. And then my second recommendation is if you want to learn more about long-term care, it's really highly individualized. So I would encourage you uh, to seek out an insurance expert if you want to go through uh, through some kind of um, long-term care insurance policy, seek out an insurance expert who can get you specific quotes for you on these policies that we've listed above. Traditional long-term care, maybe an annuity with the long-term care rider, or maybe a life insurance policy with the long-term care rider in it as well, as as well as those other alternative options that I mentioned before uh, for insurance. There is nothing better than seeing um, what the costs are going to potentially be in your state, as well as seeing what the cost of these insurance policies are going to be in your own life, given your own health and your history. So, wow, that's a lot. That's all I've got for today. I appreciate you joining me, and I will see you next time. Bye. Thanks again for listening. As a reminder, you should consult with a financial advisor familiar with the specific circumstances of your unique financial situation before making any financial decisions. Nothing in this podcast is a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mentions of rate of return are hypothetical in nature and not a guarantee of future returns. Scott Newhouse, CFP, is an investment advisor representative of Forthright Finances, a California and Nevada registered investment advisor.